Well, the last time you guys saw this, this is when we repaired the uh, transmission shaft here, doing our Udaloy build up and turning. So what we're going to do now is go ahead and get onto the uh, crankshaft here. And we need to go in here in the end of the crankshaft, set this up in the lathe, go inside here and bore that out, clean it up, and then machine a bushing and uh, press a bushing in there to bring it to the size to uh, fit this shaft right here. So just make a new pilot bearing for that. So I've got this piece of bronze right here. This used to be a prop shaft. This is a very old prop shaft right here. It's a really good material. And it's the only uh, size that I have in a, a bronze bearing type of material that, uh, that I can use to make that bearing right there. So, or bushing. So this is what we're gonna use. We'll go ahead and we'll get this set up, machine this first, and then once we get this machine, we'll go ahead and make our bushing and get that pressed in there, all right? All right, it's time to get this thing chucked up. I was gonna point out how I'm gonna hold it there, so I wanna use my six jaw chuck to hold this, and we're gonna run it in the steady rest. My original plan was to chuck it on this main right here, this, this bearing journal, since we know that's running true with the rest of them, but this gear is just slightly bigger than this bearing right there so I can't actually grab onto that unless we had made some kind of shim or something to chuck on it so I was gonna grab it on this journal here instead but for whatever reason this journal here is like a couple thousandths off from the rest of it so instead of using this journal here because I want to use my six jaw and not have to move things around use a four jaw we're just going we're going to chuck this splined in right here I've already chucked it and ran it and it's nice and true with the rest of the shaft here so i don't have the steady rest set all it is is just set really close so that i can do this right here just set it in there not have to hold it and then we'll uh, get this in adjusted where we want to just hold it up a little while you get the jaw snugged up and we'll go around and Tighten up all three pinions on the scroll chuck here evenly. It always works really nice to uh, get it right back to its uh, dead true position there. All right, let's see. So I'll put it on low here, and you can see. So running real nice right there. I'm going to go ahead and get the steady rest set. This is already locked down to the bedway. So I'm just going to run this in there ever so lightly until it just, just touches. So I can actually feel it touching now. And that jaw, that pad isn't perfectly square across there. Let me go around to the other side. Right here's the back side. Just barely. Now I can actually feel the friction of this rotating on this handle right there. So I know that we're, uh, we're touching right there. I'm gonna use some of this uh, Blue Molly, Never Seize. We'll put a little bit of that on there to help uh, keep it lubed and I'm trying to uh, gall up that journal here. Okay, and then the last thing we need to do is just go ahead and lock these in. Just touch it. What we'll do every so often, we'll come in here, this is just whey oil. And I'll just put a little bit of whey oil there to help keep that nice and slick. I'm gonna be using this half inch boring bar that was uh, given to me by Steve Barton over at Solid Rock Machine Shop. This is a bar that he actually produces and sells. It's a double-ended bar, so he's got both ends machined uh, to fit this carbide insert. And uh, the package actually comes with the uh, insert number and the screw number there in case you need replacements. 
And uh, his theory on this bar is that oftentimes these small bars get abused on the end. They get broken or damaged. And then instead of uh, not having a good end to use, you can simply flip the bar around, have another end there that's uh, ready to go. So we got it all set up. I'm going to show you a little trick that I got. Uh, I've got my, this is one of my granddad's old uh, Sterrett height gauges right here. And I keep it set over here on my cabinet. And I use this as a quick reference. I've got this set to the center line of the uh, spindle here. So whenever I'm setting a tool, I can just quickly come up here like this. I got to tighten up the tool post there and come up there and set the, uh, the tip of the tool on center. In this case, I've got the insert just slightly above center since we're going to be up inside that bore. But another little trick, you know, a lot of people have these old height gauges right here that they really don't use much and having an extra one this is a handy way to uh, keep one around the lathe just for uh, setting your tool height there i'm going to use the scale here to measure the approximate depth of what the uh, the bore is and using the metric scale here it looks like it's 20 millimeters deep or right at three quarters of an inch deep so that kind of gives me an idea I, since this is a metric shaft or metric crankshaft i'm probably just going to consider that 20 millimeters deep right there. Let's go ahead and get a touch off back there at the back of the hole. Just kind of easing it in there. All right. I feel I'm touching, so I'm going to go ahead and bring it out to the bore and then go back again. All right. So I feel pretty confident that's the uh, back. I'm going to set the zero over here. We should have a good stop there at the back of the hole. All right, let's start getting this hole cleaned up. Take our first pass through there. I've got a good uh, depth set on a indicator here. Taking 50 thousandths there. So they got a counter bore here of 24 millimeters. All right, I'm using an inch there, so that's going to be uh, I mic'd it at 9.45 inches. So we're just going to make our bushing our bushing bore a little bit smaller than that. I'm not sure if this is a pilot for something that you know wherever whatever is mounting on this right here. If uh, they're using a pilot there, but we're not going to make our bushing, you know come all the way out to this end right there. We're just going to make it whatever depth I've got it. I just uh, used the scale again. It looks like it's 22 millimeter is the depth there. I kind of touched the back of the, the hole. So I probably went in there about two millimeters deep. So we're, uh, I'm around 832 right there. I'm probably going to make it this, maybe call it seven eighths of an inch, probably bore it to about uh, 0.875 inches. And if that looks good right there, we'll just leave it, leave it there. I got my bore where I want it. I want to just clean up that shoulder there where the uh, smaller bore starts. There we go. It was just a little bit more of that rolled, air, uh, rolled metal there. I want to just get that cleaned up so that we had a good straight shoulder there. Well, our machining is complete for the crankshaft here. We're going to go ahead and take this out. And then uh, we'll go back in there with our piece of bronze material here and machine our bushing accordingly. So a slight change of plans on how I'm going to be machining the uh, the pilot bearing that's going to go in there. Or I, I call it the pilot bushing. 
So I had showed you this piece right here. This is some one inch prop shaft material, bronze prop shaft. And you can see I had actually started machining it right there. And um, this is what I had planned on using. And I was actually uh, talking to our good friend Keith Finner um, yesterday and I was, uh, we got to talking about different things and I was mentioning, you know, this old prop shaft material and I was going to use it to make a bushing. He made a recommendation that I should actually use oil light or oil impregnated bearing stock, which would be uh, SAE 863, I believe, which is this stuff right here. And this would be, this would actually make a better and proper bushing for this application right here. So the, the prop shaft material is actually silicon bronze and uh, not, not really the best stuff for uh, a bearing, maybe a, a low speed, you know, if you can keep it good and lubed, it'll be fine. But, you know, this is going to be in an application where you can't, you can't grease this or lube it or anything. So I think that uh, Keith is on to something and that this uh, oil impregnated bronze bushing stock would make a better bearing. So I didn't have uh, what I needed and the bushings, I, I bought this from McMaster car and that's what we're going to use. And they've got, they've actually got bushings already made the size that you can purchase, you know, but uh, I've got to make one. And the small bushing that I could have bought to uh, just machine the OD and then the ID and then part it off was like half the cost of just getting a whole piece of bar stock. So I just, bought a one foot length of it that way I can make this bushing and I've got more stock here on the shelf to use for later projects so that's what we're going to do we're going to go to lathe and uh, machine the bushing out of the oil impregnated bronze got to put it in gear first preferably high gear I'm just going to use my high speed tool to do the machining on this. Checking my center height there. We're going to spot it with a center drill and actually sp spot drill it with this spotting drill here. And then we'll drill the bore with a 17-32nd drill. Then we'll bore it out. I like to use a center drill just to get the very center of it started. put an actual uh, spot face on there with the uh, spotting drill here that'll assure that the drill follows it I want to show you guys what bore and bar I'm going to be using to uh, bore this bushing. This is the uh, Micro Quick system from Micro 100. And what I have is two of their tool holders here, and I've got a few of their bore and bars and different uh, different profiles of bore and bars. So this is, the, this is the actual tool that we'll be using to bore it out with. This is the half inch shank. And then you also have, they, they make this in several different shank sizes. I also have the uh, 3 8 This is the tool holder right here. So it goes in your um, tool holder like this, whether it be your you know clamp-in style like that or come down with a set screw. They have the flats machined on it so that it lines it up on center line. And if you look, going through the center here, there's a, there's a pin that's drilled and pressed in there, okay? And you can see that if you look down through there, you can kind of see that pin. So what that does, the way they've got these uh, tools made is on the back of the the back of the bar they've got this angle ground on it and whenever you stick these tools into the holder 
it automatically lines up whenever you push it in there you see it kind of turns the pin there is lining up on that angle and it's putting the tool completely on the proper center line okay so as long as you have the the tool holder clamped in there securely on the flat once you put the tool in there it lines up so then you've got a they've got this groove here ground in it and then there's a set screw right in here so once you push it back in there and square it up you just simply snug up the uh, the set screw and that seats it that locks it in place so it does make it a very convenient system to um, be able to swap these tools out take them in and out and then it'll always be on the center line so they make these in so many different styles like this right here is a is a radius tool for getting in and cutting you know if you want to cut a radius on a shoulder that would be good for that let's see what else we got i grabbed a couple of them out of my box here and uh, so this is a grooving tool if you need to get in and cut a groove for say a snap ring just a beautiful job on their grinding they make them in threading tools as well let's see if yep there's one of the threading tools and then, of course, I've got it, like I said, for the 3.8. So I've got several of the uh, the 3.8 shank, and this would be good for getting into smaller, even smaller bores. That's the uh, the inside radius profile tool there. So we've got them. I've got just a few of each. I got the radius, the grooving, and the boring tools, and, and the threading tool, just kind of like one of each to kind of get me started. And then they make them in different lengths. Like this is one of the this is one of the longer ones right here. So if you got to get in there a little bit further. So I wanted to share that with you because I love this tooling system right here. It's very, very nice quality and um, I enjoy using it. So we'll use this one right here to get our bushing board to size. Don't have much to come out of this thing. I'm going to make a cleanup pass here, mic it and, and then get it board to size. We're going to a uh, 14 millimeter bore with a few thousandths clearance over the shaft. We don't want it real tight. All right, this would be our final cut through there. So our bushing OD is going to finish at 0.875. That'll give it one thousandths press fit into the uh, crankshaft there. on 875 ready to go our bushing is going to be 21 millimeters in length it's going to scale it doesn't have to be exact but I'll uh, scale it out right here with just a a shade over the 21 millimeter mark and then we'll uh, put it back in the chuck here and uh, put a face and chamfer on the other side so I'm just eyeballing it just uh, like a line one line past got our little catcher rod all right I think we're ready to go yeah yeah this uh, blade does not like parting always catches up to it. Alright. There we go. There's our 
there's our bushing. We'll put it back in there and clean that side up. Just clean that face up and then we'll uh, go back in there with my chamfering tool here to break the corners. ready to go into the crankshaft now and what I'm going to have to do I believe I need to check it out probably going to have to uh, machine a, a little pressing tool to be able to reach down in there and get this pressed all the way into the uh, the bore All right, there's our new bushing, and we're going to press it into that uh, bore there for the crankshaft. We've got one thousandths press fit on it, and then here's our shaft that we did our build-up repair, and this is where it's going to ride right there. So what I'm going to do is use this piece. This is, looks like some hot rolled one-inch stock, and I'm just going to make a simple press tool out of this. So I'm going to turn it so that it fits down inside this bushing. I'm also going to relieve it just kind of like how it looks right there so that it fits inside this bore. This is a 24 millimeter bore, counter bore right here. So I'll probably turn it down to like 23 millimeters so that it'll clear this bore and we'll get that uh, bushing pressed down in there with that. It's just a simple little press tool. We got you over on the dake press. There's the uh, press tool and the bushing. I've got this set up in the best way that I can, just uh, with what I have without having to make any other kind of bars, using a uh, bearing splitter right here. It's like a clamshell type uh, tool that you put behind something to, and use pullers to pull it off. So it is sitting in there, and I wanted to flip it over on the flat side and have the flat side of it because you can see we got a little rock right there because of the curvature inside here, but it wouldn't fit. As I said, this is the best stack up that I can that I could get this thing. We want to press on this flange and not press on the bottom and try to, you know, we don't want to bend that crankshaft in any way. So we just want to press right here where we're going into it. So let's see if it works. Just kind of line it up by line it up by sight. Sorry my hands in the way. We got to work the hand wheel over on this other side. All right, looks like it's gonna work out pretty good. Just a little bit, a little bit further. It should stop on that shoulder right there. Just about there. Should just bottom out, really. There it is. That's the bottom. And that worked out beautifully. There we go. Man, we are basically DUN done with this thing. Let me go ahead and pull it off here and I'll show you what we're talking about. I mean, that's where we had it pulled up against to uh, do our pressing there. Got our new pilot bushing in the crank, been bored, new bushing pressed in, got our transmission shaft that's been welded on the end with our Utiloy torch. We now have a proper fit.
Alrighty guys, that's the end of this job right here. I'm real uh, happy with the results of everything that, that worked out here, our welding and then setting up and boring our crank ca uh, crankshaft for the new bushing. Bushing looks great in there. I think everything is going to be back in order for, uh, for Jonathan. So I'll have to start getting this boxed up and uh, get it sent back down to Titusville. I hope you guys enjoyed the project and come back for some more. For the uh, for the next one in line. See you then. One of my longtime viewers sent me this chart here. This was uh, given to me by Dana Gray, and uh, this is a chart from Turner Steel Company, a laminated chart that's got all your specifications for metals. Any, anything from you know structural to uh, solid steels, uh, angle irons, channels, T's, rounds, tubing, pipe. Uh, cold rolled bars, all that kind of stuff. It gives you your weight per foot and it gives you all your sizing and specifications that you might need to know for all of your uh, structural metals. So these are really handy a lot of times, especially for uh, machine shops and uh, welding shops when you're trying to figure out, you know, weights and, uh, and different data that you need to know for your metal. So I'm going to stick it right up here on my metal wall and I'm just going to use a couple of my magnets. I've got, uh, let's see, we'll just kind of put it right there. I need to get some more of these magnets, but I got a couple left here. And uh, real handy for just kind of magging things right to this metal wall there. So that's going to be a nice chart to have. We're going to go ahead and pull his uh, note off there. All right. So that's going to be nice. Just an easy place to put it up right there. So thank you very much, Dana. Very cool. This is my Hot Shot 360 oven that I purchased from uh, Stan Zikoski. He's uh, uh, shading HKW on YouTube there, does the Bar Z Bash. And uh, this was one of the units in his uh, first uh, big run of Hot Shots that uh, I got in on. I believe he's, uh, he's made some modifications to these and kind of improved them in some of the way that he manufactures. But uh, this is actually the first time I've had this kind of like just sitting in my office for uh, since last year. And I want to go ahead and uh, we've got it plugged in. I want to go ahead and turn it on and do the uh, first initial heat up, which is what he recommends to burn it in. It's going to kind of uh, burn this all in. It's going to smoke and smell pretty bad, but we're going to go ahead and do that because I want to get this thing um, out here and ready. I've got a couple of parts that I may be uh, just kind of doing a little bit of research on on the proper way to get them heat treated. And I may try to uh, perform that myself since I now have a heat treat oven. So that's, uh, that's what it looks like there. Stan builds this whole thing himself. Does a really good job. It's a very high quality unit. So we're going to go ahead. I went ahead and turned it on a minute ago just to make sure that I was getting power and it was working right. And uh, so we'll go ahead and close it up and turn it on. And I'm going to let it do its thing. Start, uh, start heating up. It's already a little over 100 because I plugged it in a minute ago. It starts heating up pretty fast. And I got my doors open because it's going to put off a little bit of smoke. And I just, we'll have it, we'll have it uh, where the shop can air out. Well, you can see just how fast it's climbing there. It's been a couple of days since I, that last clip where I showed you we were just heating this thing up. So I've gone through several cycles with the hot shot. Uh, as per Stan's instructions to get it all burned in and we've got it up to 1750 which is going to be one of the temps we'll probably be using when we're doing our heat treating just wanted to show you we'll go ahead and pop the lid open so it's starting to uh, once you fire this thing up for the first time it starts burning in and smelling and smoking all of this uh, is going to turn sort of like a brownish black color in there from the carbon and then as you keep going through the cycles of uh, burning it in, it's going to start turning white again. And then this uh, ring on the outside of the lid right here on the face, is, will, he said, will slowly start to disappear as well. So I just wanted to show you that right there, uh, that we are making our way into uh, you know getting it ready for some heat treating. I have done one test piece. Also want to point out the uh, controller right here is uh, you can use it manually like i've got it set up now just uh, 1750 and then you can out, you can also program this controller here to do any kind of uh you know any any type of soak or time or heat cycle that you want to do you can pre-program it he gives you all the instructions to do that you can even pop this guy out 
and plug it in with a little USB cord uh, and run a little program on your computer and do it that way and it just plugs in there and you can uh, transfer the the data straight over to the to the programmer so real happy with the unit it seems to be working really well and um, i can't say enough for a stands uh, high quality construction on stuff like this what i've been doing is uh, I, i've got two of these heat insulating tiles that dennis nolan over at niagara cutter he had given these a couple years ago to me. So I took one of them and I've been kind of cutting them and I've made a couple of like what you would call parallels or just blocks that I can uh, sit in there to kind of elevate a, a workpiece. I'm going to be making some more of these and cutting them into thinner pieces and make like maybe some uh, little V-notches in some of them so that you can stand a piece of Roundup. But I just wanted to show that, just some of that uh, foam. Uh, this is supposed to be the same material that they used on the uh, space shuttle uh, for the heat insulating tiles. Uh, uh, foam silica and this is the first test piece that I'd done and I uh, didn't take any filming of it because I was testing it uh, just off camera but it's a piece of 4140 the uh, annealed 4140 and when I tested it before I heat treated I was getting around 11 to 12 Rockwell C so I did a heat treat cycle uh, did the oil quench and then tempered it and I'm getting a consistent 50 C now reading right here across this face I did machine it after I did the uh, heat treat and then that's the annealed color right there which was at 500 degrees so this is something that I am the fan just kicked on there which is uh, one of the uh, how he's designed that to keep it cool so this is something that's all uh, uh, pretty well new to me and I'm gonna be doing a lot of learning on uh, doing some heat treat of uh, not only like a tool steel but 4140 I machine that a lot and it's a good material to make uh, certain items out of and even tools. I have, actually I have uh, three parts that's coming up very soon that I will be filming and sharing with you that I'm going to be building out of 4140 material and I want to do a heat treat on them in the oven here to try to get them to a, uh, you know, a stronger material from, from what you just buy there. So that's going to be coming up pretty soon. And then one last thing. This is the instructions that Stan gives you on your initial burn-in. So he does give you the instructions here and um, what you need to know whenever you're I'm trying to get to the paper here, whenever you want to uh, program it. So we've got the information right here on how to program the controller over here if you want to do it manually. Or as I said, you can plug it into the program. So these run $860 uh, from Stan. For this unit right here, he does have a larger unit that he's going to be uh, building as well called the Hot Shot 1200. The uh, number indicates the cubic inches inside the oven. This one's got 360 cubic inch. This 1200 is going to be nearly four times as much inside there. So anyway, I just wanted to give Stan a nice little plug because I really love his oven. I'm just finally getting it plugged in and uh, starting to learn it and going to start using it here real soon. I've been putting a little bit of use on my new Noga indicator holder. This is one of the fixed arm indicator holders here. I've just been using it to uh, cram in the vise today. I really love the, uh, I always go with the fine adjust on the base right here. Fine adjust bottom on all the Nogas is the way to go. Really fine tune it. But the indicator holder seems to be working really nice. getting it crammed in. I've been so used to the uh, articulating arm notice for such a long time that it's nice to uh, actually go back to a rigid fixed arm holder and give it a try and uh, kind of see how it does. It's got nice beefy rods to it. You can use uh, the dovetail mount or the uh, you know, 3 8 stem, whatever, you know, typical with all the other indicator holders there. And I love that really fine adjust on it. You can just 
dial that indicator in nice and easy. So this particular one, let's take it to the book right here. PH4016, this is the one that I'm using right there. They've got three different sizes. And then they also have the uh, fine adjust top, but I just don't care for that style. I think the ones that have the fine adjust on the bottom are the best ones in the way to go. I'm working on getting the vertical head mounted up to the uh, K&T mill. And whenever you go to mount this on there, uh, it always centers up very, very close, but it'll be within one to two thousandths out of tram. So once you clamp it on, it's going to be tilted one way or the other, uh, one to two thousandths on your indicator there. This time I was uh, well within one thousandths whenever I checked it, but I thought I'd just show you uh, my little system here. So I just set up an indicator holder and uh, a nice test indicator. And I just have to, I have to move this by hand. So I'm turning it like this. And I'm just sweeping from one side of the vise to the other. And I've got it, it should be within tenths. That's a half a thousandths resolution best test indicator. And the uh, best that I can read it right now is probably two tenths on either side. I mean, that side is lined up right on zero. I just I thought I would show you my my process that I normally go through whenever I'm uh, getting this head set back up. You got to tram it or it'll be off just a little bit. I forgot to mention that whenever I'm tramming it, I use a soft blow hammer. In this case, this nylon hammer right here. And depending on which way I need to go, because this thing will be tilted one way or the other, you just come in here and you tap the bottom on either side lightly with these uh, just very lightly clamped up to uh, get it moved to where you need to go.